Hello everyone. Today here I've got a stack of physics books that I got out from the library and they all deal with ideas relating to time or space and time travel. I thought it would be really interesting to see how these books go about describing and illustrating time travel because time travel is something that usually belongs in fiction books or sci-fi and is treated in a very fanciful way. But these are non-fiction books, and some are written by quite serious scientists, so I thought it would be interesting to see how they unravel the same ideas, and how time travel is treated by people who are dedicated to studying it. The first book in our lineup today is Geometry, Relativity and the Fourth Dimension by Rudy Rucker. Now if you've been following my short videos about the fourth dimension, you'll have met some ideas from this book already, but tucked away in its chapters, there's a compelling discussion on time travel. This diagram here is to get us thinking in terms of space-time. It shows these flat slices of our world that are moving forward in time. In this particular example, there are two characters, a square and a triangle, living on a flat plane. This is what their world looks like at 12 o'clock, but five minutes later at the slice, 12.05, the triangle has moved towards the square, maybe to say hello, and then five minutes later again at 12.10, the triangle has moved away, meaning that in space-time, you could draw the triangle as a worm that snakes over here and then back again, whereas Mr. Square remains stationary the entire time, and their world line is just this straight line. This just shows two characters, but you could try to represent the entire world or universe using these world lines, and it would be a vast tangle of worms. You could represent every atom by one line. And because every atom in a person's body is replaced every seven years or so, there wouldn't actually be a single thread that goes the whole length of a person's life. A living individual is a persistent pattern of world lines, rather than a particular collection of particles. Drawing world lines helps you think of space-time as a structure all of its own, where the universe at any instant is a 3D cross-section. But that does make us wonder why we can't see the past or future if they really exist. One idea is that maybe all instants of time do exist, but because our memories only relate to events that happened at previous time steps to our present moment, we get the illusion that we are moving forwards in time always. The author then makes a slight departure from physics, but this next diagram helped me to understand meditation better than any yoga class I've been to. He asks if there is a way to be conscious in a static space-time instead of always moving forwards. Well, one trick to achieve the feeling of timelessness is to stop thinking new thoughts because without that, it's hard to distinguish one moment from the next. To achieve this timelessness, you could either think nothing at all, which is not easy, or concentrate your attention on a repetitive thought loop, like a mantra. Thinking nothing, you can't differentiate one instant from the next, and doing a mantra, you can't differentiate one repetition of the mantra from the next. This next diagram here shows a way to time travel to the past, although it only works in a universe where time is circular. In this universe, the time dimension is wrapped into a cylinder, and space extends infinitely out to the sides. This circle here represents the world line of the Earth. If you say that it takes one trillion years for time to repeat itself, so that is the circumference of this world line, to time travel, we could leave the Earth, speeding off to the side for, say, a quarter of a trillion years. Then we could turn around and travel back this way for, say, half a trillion years. Then turn around again and take another quarter of a trillion years to get back to where we started. But because time is circular, we will intersect the world line of the Earth in its past. Ideas of circular time have been proposed in physics, but there are plenty of practical reasons why a journey like this, taking a trillion years and needing to travel close to the speed of light, is not going to work. You'd need a rocket the size of a galaxy to have enough fuel, and you'd probably get lost. This next book is Paul Davies' About Time. 
In a chapter on time reversal, there is a discussion about antimatter and how there are things called positrons, which are like anti-electrons. They have the opposite charge. But maybe they also go back in time. Electrons and positrons are created together in pairs. Usually it's from a photon colliding with an atom. They fly off and hope to never see each other again, because if a positron were to run into an electron, then the pair would instantly annihilate and reverse this pair creation process, giving back photons. This is a space-time diagram, where here a photon coming into point A creates an electron-positron pair. The positron then meets with another electron and annihilates, giving back a photon. At this time t, an observer would see three particles, an electron, a positron, and another electron. But according to Richard Feynman, this zigzag track could be viewed as the world line of just one particle, an electron that travels back in time between these annihilation and creation events. That's why the arrow here for the positron is pointing backwards. Feynman's theory was that this is all just one electron, and it travels back in time for that brief period where it is considered a positron. This idea could be extended to include many more electrons and positrons, and you could say that all the electrons in the universe are just the same one particle, that there is just one electron making up the entire universe. It offers a nice explanation for why all electrons appear to be identical, but that theory comes with problems of its own. It would also predict that the universe is made exactly of half matter and half antimatter, but we don't see nearly as much antimatter as we do normal matter. And the arrow of time in our universe appears to point forwards, rather than having a symmetry pointing backwards. Another way to time travel to the past is detailed in this next book, Time Travel in Einstein's Universe by J. Richard Gott. Gott mentioned something called cosmic strings, which are thin strands of high density material left over from the early universe. This diagram is designed to show what space time looks like around a cosmic string. It's like a piece of pizza missing a slice. If we take out that slice and stick it together, we get a cone. Here, my pencil is the cosmic string, and the cone is what a horizontal plane of space-time around the string looks like. Suppose that here's the Earth, here's the cosmic string, and here's a quasar, split across the region of the missing slice. These straight lines show the path that light would take from the quasar to reach Earth. And here's what those paths look like in the conical space-time. To us on Earth, it will appear as if there are two different quasars, even though it's the same object. And even though the light is traveling on the shortest, straightest path to us from the quasar, one of the paths will be shorter. This is the principle of gravitational lensing, and may be what helps us to find cosmic strings. The light traveling along path 2 has beaten the light traveling along path 1, and if it was a rocket traveling along path 2, traveling at nearly the speed of light, it could have also beaten light path 1. If cosmic strings exist, then you could travel in a spaceship and outrun a light beam by taking the shorter of two paths around a cosmic string. When the rocket arrives at Earth, the light showing its departure from the quasar won't have arrived yet. So you could look back and see yourself still on the quasar, about to depart. On another page in this book, there's instructions on how to build a time machine that can visit the future. To construct this time machine, you need to find the mass of the planet Jupiter and construct it around yourself into a spherical shell. That will create a huge gravitational well around you, but because it's a sphere, it will perfectly cancel out in every direction, and inside the shell, you will feel unaffected. We're just teetering on the limit of mass concentration that would create a black hole, so you don't want to go overboard with this. Just outside of the spherical shell, you would be torn apart by tidal forces generated by its gravitational attraction. But inside the sphere, you would be perfectly safe. This diagram simplifies the situation down to just a two-dimensional shell, so it's drawn around this time traveler here as a circle, but for us it would actually be a sphere. 
If you imagine an ant falling into something this shape, it would require a lot of energy to crawl back out. The same thing will happen with our photons. Photons emitted by us will lose a lot of energy on the way out and be redshifted, turning into longer wavelength light. Photons from outside of the well that fall in will pick up energy as they fall. The person inside of the well would see these waves oscillating faster than they did on the outside. And if the people outside the well had been using a clock which relied on the oscillation of these waves, the person inside of the well would see these clocks to be ticking four times faster. If the time traveller managed to safely disassemble the well, he would step out of his time machine and be younger than those around him. Another way to time travel to the future is by moving really fast, usually running away on a rocket going near the speed of light, leaving Earth for a bit, then turning around and coming back and being younger than everyone around you. I think this diagram does a good job of explaining why a clock on a rocket ship moving fast actually ticks more slowly than one that's left on Earth. If you construct a clock that uses the bouncing of light off mirrors to measure the time, then this is what our clock on Earth would look like. The light would predictably bounce between the two mirrors and the clock would tick every time it hit one. Give that same clock to an astronaut on a moving rocket, and if we observed that astronaut from the outside of their space station, this is what we would see. The mirrors are still separated by the same distance, but because the rocket is moving past us, we will see the light bounce off the bottom mirror, and then bounce off the top mirror, but the distance between the mirrors will no longer be the initial three feet separation. It will be longer because it's traveled on this diagonal line. Because light travels at a constant speed, if it's traveling a greater distance, then there will be a greater time delay between these two ticks of the clock. So this astronaut's clock will tick more slowly compared to ours. It will happen to everything on board. Even the astronaut's heart is a kind of clock. And that is why when the astronaut returns to Earth after their journey, they won't have physically aged as much as someone who was left on Earth. Most books that mention time travel will have one of these, a Minkowski or space-time diagram. These diagonal lines represent an object moving at the speed of light. Anything less steep than that will be inside of these cones and will be from either the past or the future of point P. Because things can travel from anywhere in this region to P, anything in this cone could have affected P. It is its past light cone. Same with the future. Anything from P could affect anything in this region. But these points A and B are outside of the light cones. This is the region of elsewhere. Whilst A and B might happen at the same time as P, they cannot affect P because light could not travel from here to here. All observers agree on the light paths because light travels at the same speed for all observers, but depending on how fast you are moving yourself, the axes X and T will actually move and change based on your reference frame. And now here are some highly commended extra entries. Space time breaking up where at a mini microscopic level, quantum effects are so violent that they start to tear space and time apart completely, creating a sponge-like structure of wormholes and bridges. This activity would be unnoticed by even a subatomic particle, which would be larger than the wormhole. This one shows a rocket stuck inside of a black hole. The rocket is always dragged back down, and so are light signals that they try to send out. There's no escape and no way to let anyone know that you are here. This figure shows black and white holes. A is a collapse to a black hole, and B is an explosion from a white hole. This one's too complicated for me to understand enough to explain, but the study of black and white holes looks very cool. Here's an interesting model called a self-creating universe, where the universe has a time loop at its beginning, meaning the question of what happened before the universe existed doesn't really apply, because according to this, the universe is its own creation. And if you were to go back in time throughout the history of the universe, you would end up intersecting with your own tail. 
Thanks for joining me on this look through some physics books. Thanks to my patrons for making this video possible, and a special shout out to today's patron cat of the day, Freeway.